I want to start by saying um, what a unique honor and privilege it is to be here. Um, I want to thank also the selection committee for allowing my class's uh, story and their project about uh, this one, one girl from our school uh, to reach a, a wider audience. So uh, I'd like to begin with uh, just by expressing my gratitude. This is Dundas Central Public School. This is where I spend uh, a big chunk of my life. On your left is what it looks like now. Uh, that's the building that I walk into every day. Um, on the right is what it looked like um, for the girl that we are going to talk about. That, that's, uh, that's what the building looked like. It was built in 1857. And just, I want to give you an idea of the history of the, this building holds. Uh, a number of years ago, some of us on staff, uh, we knew that there was a, a ladder in the caretaker's closet, and we didn't know where it went. Um, and so we, we, we took a look. It went into the attic of our school. And I wish I could express the gasp, the emotional gasp I felt um, coming up out of the ladder into this attic. The first thing you notice at the, is that the walls and the joists of this building, and it, it stretches back into shadow, are filled, filled with the names and initials of students who have snuck up uh, over the last 163 years to put their, to, 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 to put their names in there. And, and thankfully, so many of them have dated it. There are, there are um, romances uh, from the 1870s that are, are, are up there. Um, and and uh, it, it, it was a, a moment for us, uh, I think collectively as a staff, to realize what a, what a time capsule our building is. And I, I wanted to start with that to preface what's I'm going to talk about, and I'll, I'll loop back to that um, in, the, in the end. Um, on your left is my class from last year. This is a, a class of 10 and 11 year olds. Um, and on the right is what they would have looked like 100 years uh, prior. Uh, we began, I knew we were coming up to the 100th anniversary of the, of the influenza epidemic, and I wanted to, to teach my kids about it and, and to get into a unit about it. And it began in my head, as every teacher over the summer, you're sort of constructing what things are gonna look like um, in the year to come. And in my head, it was a very traditional unit. Um, and, but I got thinking about, about our school, and perhaps because of that trip to the attic, I wondered, had that epidemic actually touched the lives of any of the, the, the people had, that uh, were at our school at the time. And a block from my building is an incredible institution called the Dundas Museum and Archives. Um, and I, I went knocking and, um, and, uh, and I asked Anna Patterson, Patterson, the education coordinator there, can you help me with this? Is, is, had the influenza epidemic had any impact on, on our school directly? And sure enough, it had. Um, we discovered, uh, thanks to the museum, that a girl named uh, Hazel Isabel Layden had, uh, had died um, after contracting the, the, epi um, the disease. And that changed everything, because we'd begun the unit again in a very traditional way. And for my students, it was like a, and for myself, it was like a, a light switch went off. Um, and this went from being a story about a global event um, to a very, very personal event. And I, I, the engine behind that event was, was a question that the kids ultimately generated. And the question was, who was Hazel? Who was Hazel Layden? To answer that question, we knew we had to, to reach out in the first, to, to other organizations and institutions. And one of the first uh, groups we went to were uh, the people that gave us her name in the first place, and that was the Dundas Museum. Um, they helped us uh, begin to answer that question. They provided us um, with artifacts and resources that certainly I would not have otherwise had, had access to. And these records, um, and these are just a few examples, these records created really what I would call a critical architecture, if you will, to the unit. Um, it, they, they gave us the, the facts of the beginnings and endings of things, um, the, place, the places, the street names, the addresses, um, and, and the dates. 
they also, though, began to make this real. Um, students, are, particularly my students, are used to me a lot of talking, um, and for them to, to, to be able to hold the, these primary documents began to bring an authority to, to our search, um, and, and very much to make it real. For me, what made it real, uh, and where the gravity of, of, of the unit, I think, began for me was when I saw her parents' names on her death certificate. Um, I'm a father, and um, I can't imagine the hell that, uh, that began uh, when that document was filled out uh, for them. For my students, it was her obituary. And again, reading that um, was, uh, I think, where that was when the, the real hook sank in for them. And they realized that we were beginning to work and to talk about a real person. I want to make a note just because I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but um, having kids work with primary documents was a game changer for me and, and certainly has changed the way I, I, I've continued to teach subsequently. Uh, my students do things uh, in social studies were normally um, very traditional ones, maybe like the ones you had growing up, certainly what I had growing up, and nothing wrong with that. Um, but it, it, uh, it was, I, I suspect, at least in my case as a teacher looking back, it was pretty formulaic. This year that I'm speaking of and the years, uh, the, uh, the, the year I'm in now, our duotangs are filled with primary documentation. The kids' duotangs had birth certificates and death records um, and copies of all of these things, um, which I think led, uh, brought a, an, a certain authenticity and realness uh, to, to the experience. One of the other set of resources that the museum put in our hands was a lot of the journalism from the period. And from that journalism in particular, we got a sense of the disease's impact on our community. Um, we got to read really the public record of the, of the events and responses to uh, the influenza epidemic. The, we also got glimpses of very personal documents. This is the Layden family's card of thanks. Um, and it is uh, their letter to the community saying thank you to everything the community did. One of the things I love that my students took away was this idea uh, um, that though we are surrounded in moments of crisis, like a global epidemic, with emotions such as fear and grief and confusion, that we don't cower and we don't hide in our homes. We get out and we help our neighbors. They learned that the scouts, their job, uh, the scouts were, uh, were organized and they brought um, uh, food and uh, clean linen to all uh, people throughout the community who couldn't otherwise access it. All the teachers that were at my school, um, they ceased to be teachers and they became nurses in the community. All the car dealers lent out their fleets so that people in the rural communities around Dundas uh, could, be, uh, could access, um, so we, we, they could get nurses and, and medical care out to them. Um, all of the people with checkbooks wrote big, big checks. Um, that the community came together, and that was, a, uh, I think, was empowerment for students, and particularly in, in our era of climate change and other, other uh, seemingly overwhelming uh, problems, is, is a really important uh, message for us to pass on to our kids. One of the other people we reached out to was this man, and I would, I would love you all to shake his hand. You would adore him. His name is Stan Novak. He is a gem in the crown of my community. He is a... Um, uh, He's an amateur historian. He is. Uh, he loves Dundas, and he gave us a tour of our our community's cemetery, and he taught the kids about their history through the cemetery. And he's a magnificent storyteller. And he also helped us find Hazel's gravestone. And I want to just note that artifacts like the gravestone or some of the, the uh, other resources uh, that that we worked with at, at the museum, they they make possible an intimacy with history, um, and and that I think is key particularly for kids. They remind us that large events take place on the personal level, that even global events are lived by individuals. And so, for instance, if you were to ask my students about, uh, describe for me uh, the, uh, the influenza epidemic of 2018, 2019, they would begin, I suspect, by telling you about Hazel's gravestone. That th this uh, this tour had a big impact on them. 
the other, uh, one of the other key groups that we reached out to was Knox Presbyterian Church. We found out through various records that her, uh, Hazel's family was actively involved in this church. And so we re uh, reached out to uh, Reverend Garrison, who is the individual standing there. And she uh, got, got talking with her congregation. Um, she found for us, and this, I'm, I'm getting chilly up here, you can't see the goosebumps uh, that, that are coming on my arms now, but um, she found out that uh, Hazel's family is still a member, uh, Hazel's family is still involved in, at Knox Presbyter Presbyterian Church, and that um, Mrs. Barbara Weavers, who's on, the, on your right, is, uh, uh, sits in the pews every Sunday, and she is, in fact, Hazel's niece. What she brought for us was a series of family stories and anecdotes. She brought, um, talk about the intimacy of history. My students held the wedding photos and, um, and, and, and family photos of, of all, a range of Hazel's, uh, Hazel's relatives. For instance, uh, we, got to, we got to see the photo of, of Hazel's mom, uh, uh, who's there on, on your left, and uh, that's a church photo. Um, that, that's one of Hazel's sister, sisters, Mima Laden. Um, the students got to stand at the baptismal font where uh, Hazel was baptized. Uh, they saw the plaques where her brother's names are for their service in World War II, and they looked through recital programs. Uh, Hazel came from a very musical family. Um, and again, all of these artifacts, incidental and otherwise, brought forth, uh, 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 helped us reconstruct um, Hazel's life in, in, in deeply meaningful ways. However, you couldn't talk about Hazel's life without talking about her death. And the more we talked about her death, the more the kids wanted to know about what killed her. And so we reached out to uh, McMaster University, and in particular to McMaster's uh, Children and Youth University, who's run by another incredible individual, uh, whose name is Dr. Sandeep Raha, um, just a, an incredible individual. Um, and he, uh, he and his team at, um, at MCYU helped the kids understand and learn about the, uh, the influenza virus. They ran a series of five different workshops um, with the kids that ran them through the pathology and ep uh, epidemiology of the disease. Um, and they helped th the kids understand the impact of the influenza, of influenza on the human body. Um, one of our final activities, uh, I just had to note this because it was, it was so great, uh, uh, Dr. Raha took, them, took kids through um, infection models, and so how uh, infections spread. And uh, then they, there was a, a series of cool activities the, the kids did. But at the end, uh, they, they turned off all the lights in the room we were working in, and they brought out a black light. And, and they, they said, one of the things you didn't realize is that when, whenever we met with his grad students, we, we all shook hands. And, and one of his grad students had been infected uh, with a substance and had shaken the, those students' hands. And, uh, and then as the hour had progressed, that substance had, had transferred throughout the, the room and, and onto other people. And it was an incredibly good example for demonstrating how quickly, in a closed room with 28 people, um, a, uh, a, a virus could, uh, could, could spread. Uh, it was magnificent. Uh, one of the, we had two culminating activities uh, it, as part of this five-month unit. Uh, one of them was an interactive website that we put together with, uh, with MCYU and their team, uh, and uh, it was submitted in uh, Defining Moments Canada. I know many of you know, know this organization. It's magnificent. Uh, and uh, and the, their, the kids' uh, uh, submission won, which was a thrill for them. The second thing uh, we did is we, uh, we were invited back to the museum to open an exhibit. And so the museum team um, uh, helped them, uh, the kids learned through the museum uh, staff how to construct an exhibit um, in, a, in, a, in a logical and, uh, and coherent way. Um, uh, using uh, the, uh, and, and they let the students curate their own exhibit. Um, and that's what it looked like when it was done. We had an opening night. Uh, instead of wine and cheese, we had uh, cheese and apples, apple juice. Um, and uh, one of the things we found out was that, uh, that uh, Hazel was an a, a avid piano player. And, and so we did digging around, and we found a piece of music we're almost positive she knew. And, and we had two girls who played that, that music uh, that evening for, uh, for the community that came out. Um, that, that event brought together um, 
a lot of people. Um, it, it brought together uh, historians and scientists from McMaster, the pa parents obviously, and the students, community members, and it let the students create something uh, uh, real and contribute in a very um, uh, manifestly real way to their, their community's history. Um, despite all of the artifacts, however, that we went through, we never found Hazel's photograph. And it brought us back to our original question, which was, who was Hazel Layden? And, and to some degree, we, we, we questioned for a while, did we, did we really know? And it's interesting the power that, that a single photograph has to know what somebody looks like. Um, and then, you know, and, and this is what I love about kids, it was one of the kids in the class that pointed out that, that we, we'd be learning about a girl who ran in our playground. We'd be learning about a girl who learned in our classroom, like, like literally in our classroom. She played in our streets and her voice had been heard in my students' homes. I'll say that again. Her voice had been heard in my students' homes. And I'll never forget the little guy who put his hand up in class and, and announced, you know what? Hazel was one of us. That's who Hazel Layden was. Um, and what we decided we would do, I told my class about that attic, and what we decided we would do is we made a plaque, uh, uh, very simple, you'll see it in a sec, um, and we all signed it, and we put Hazel's name down there. And then I uh, snuck up to the attic, uh, the way so many people had for 163 years, and I put that, that board on, uh, I nailed it to one of the joists there, so that Hazel's name and my student's name is where it should be, um, which is among um, the, that recorded artifact of our, of our building. Um, the last thing, I, uh, second last thing I want to show you is this. This was the highlight, um, this handshake. Um, the kids in my class discovered, uh, one of them you know, uh, Mrs. Barbara Weavers, uh, they discovered two members of, uh, surviving members of Hazel's family who did not know of each other, and we invited them both. Um, and that uh, Mr. Maloney is uh, shaking uh, Mrs. Weaver's hand, and that is a re reuniting, if you will, of two uh, disparate uh, or un 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 unknown to each other uh, members of uh, her family that, that, that came together. Um, uh, at that exhibit. It was, uh, it was a very good evening. Um, I, I think Hetty has a, a very short video I'm going to conclude with. Um, and uh, from that, I just want to say thank you very much. There was a child that went to our school who actually had passed away as a result of the epidemic. And that changed everything. Finding out that a student that sat in our classroom who was so deeply affected by this pandemic made it very personal for them. So the Hazel Project started as a traditional unit. It became a, a, a series of community partnerships. Uh, first and foremost is our relationship with the Dundas Museum and Archives and McMaster Child and Youth University. Those are the two of the, the primary institutions that enriched and deepened this, this experience for the, the kids and their learning. The MCYU is a program that started about eight years ago. It's a community outreach initiative. We try to bring children from across Hamilton. We try to bring them on campus for monthly lectures given by faculty. We have a second arm of the program which goes out to schools and deploys uh, interactive workshops with our central credo which is question, discover, create. Our students from McMaster taught the students about the biology of the flu, how the flu works, how spreading of the flu works. The kids from the elementary school taught our McMaster students the history of the flu in, in Dundas and specifically how it impacted the life of this young girl named Hazel. Hazel was a 15 year old girl who went to the school and she died from pneumonia and also the Spanish flu in 1918. So we went to the museum and archives a lot. We did a lot of just sort of all around research with the museum. You can kind of all enjoy it because it, like we all had a part of it because we're, I think we're all mostly from this town. So it's kind of like, hey, she walked on that floor and then I walked on that floor, that's me. you go into the attic of our school, you will find all these names of the children have written na their names over the last 160 years on the beams, but Hale's name's not there. We've written her name on a plaque as well as the names of all of my students and we're gonna go up and, and nail that to the joy so that Hazel's there. 
where she should be. We were all here for a girl that died 100 years ago. I mean, that's really what drew us all together. And it struck me that, you know, you think that about a life and a life ending, that the story of a life doesn't end when that life does. 